Generally, my videos discuss scientific topics. However, my dealings on the internet have unfortunately led me to cross paths with people who fail to understand the scientific method. Thus, this video will be an investigation of the scientific method, so we can see the rigorous process that scientists must go through before their work can be accepted. In doing so, we will see why all pseudosciences flounder in their methodology, and why we can indeed trust the conclusions put forth by science. Before proceeding to the method itself, we must acknowledge what it isn't. There's no such thing as the one scientific method. There are many versions of the scientific method. However, they all bubble down to a few basic steps, and it's those that we'll investigate. I also need to note that the scientific method doesn't discriminate against any religions. You can be a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, a Hindu, etc., and still practice perfectly good science. Similarly, you can be American, Mexican, English, Chinese, Japanese, Ethiopian, or a member of any nationality and still practice perfectly good science. That's the best thing about science. It can be practiced perfectly well by anyone, anywhere. Now, without further ado, the first step. A question. What do you want to know about? How does it work? How does this thing affect this other thing? Does this thing affect this other thing? Asking questions is the most important part of science, and people can gauge how much you know about science simply by asking certain questions. If, for instance, you ask, where's the evidence that a fish gave birth to a monkey, or how could life have come from a rock, then people will immediately recognize that you don't know how evolution works. Or, if you do understand the topic at hand, then you could ask a technical question. For instance, is Homo habilis an advanced Australopithecine or a very primitive Homo species? Then, after you ask a question, you can formulate a hypothesis. This is a proposed explanation for some phenomenon based on limited evidence. That doesn't mean a hypothesis necessarily has no evidence. A hypothesis can have quite a bit of evidence behind it while still being a hypothesis. For example, how did bilateral symmetry appear in the animal kingdom? A major hypothesis is that a population of planuloid animals, something like the larva of a cnidarian, experienced progenesis, which is a process where sexual maturity is accelerated and slowly became aceloid over time, giving rise to the earliest bilaterally symmetrical animals. This hypothesis is supported by genetic evidence from Hox genes as well as the phylogenetic placement of acelomorph flatworms. Also, there is more than one type of hypothesis. You will formulate both a null and an alternate hypothesis. The alternate hypothesis is what you are seeking to demonstrate. On the other hand, the null hypothesis is the opposite of what you're seeking to demonstrate, or the default position on positive claims. For instance, ask the question, does smoking cause cancer? The null hypothesis would be no, smoking doesn't cause cancer, while the alternate hypothesis would be yes, smoking does cause cancer. And there's the next step, gathering evidence. This is the part where pseudoscience fails. As mentioned in my video, we all have the same data and Genesis Paradise Lost, creationists in general avoid or ignore upwards of 90% of the available, relevant, technical data. Practitioners of homeopathy and crystal and faith healing do the same, as explored in my video, Medical Madness. Similarly, anti-vaxxers, flat earthers, moon landing hoaxers, chemtrailers, 9-11 truthers, cryptozoologists, and proponents of conspiracies of all stripes must ignore evidence to retain their favored dogma. Let's take an example. Answers in Genesis wrote an article that attempts to demonstrate their long-made claim concerning how the average dinosaur size was that of a sheep, titled, Determining Average Dinosaur Size Using the Most Recent Comprehensive Body Mass Dataset. Well, the article didn't determine that the average dinosaur size was that of a sheep, nor did it even make use of the average or mean value of the available dataset. Rather, the article used the median value of their set of dinosaur sizes, which came to about the size of an ox. To come to this conclusion, the article points out that it had to cut a large list of species from the dinosaur roster. Quote, 
Before beginning our study, we eliminated all mass estimates that were classified as birds, and five arguable bird-like species that were classified as theropods, such as Microraptor gee, close quote. Why did they do this? Well, creationists have a doctrinal imperative to believe the Bible over modern science, and modern science says overwhelmingly that birds are dinosaurs, especially since birds have petamorphic dinosaur skulls. That is to say, they not only omitted birds, they also omitted clearly dromaeosaurid dinosaurs that were too bird-like. So, instead of arbitrarily deciding that birds are in the dinosaur kind, they arbitrarily decided that birds aren't, thus arbitrarily downsizing the total data set. But this is common in a worldview where facts play second fiddle to dogma. Now, gathering evidence can come in different forms. It can be a simple observation, or the easy application of one or more senses in everyday situations, or it could be peering through a massive telescope into deep space, or it could be running a tagged molecule through a bacterium to determine the workings of some biochemical process, or it could be randomly giving pills and placebos to patients, or it could be evaluating the fossils of some long-dead species, or it could involve asking large groups of people on the street what their thoughts are. There's a wide range of possibilities here. Then, the evidence you've gathered should cause you to accept either your null or alternate hypothesis. Did you find a correlation between smoking and cancer? If you did, then you can conclude that smoking causes cancer. If not, then you can conclude that smoking doesn't cause cancer. So, I've asked my question, formulated a hypothesis, gathered data, and made a conclusion. We're done, right? Not exactly. In science, after you've made your conclusion, you must submit your work for peer review. What is peer review? This is a process whereby scientists in the relevant fields evaluate your work to determine if it's correct. Posting your rantings on Facebook or Twitter and having them read by close friends and family doesn't count as scientific peer review. Instead, if you have a grievance against a particular scientific idea, then compile and submit your work to multiple scientists who operate in the relevant fields. Once a scientist submits his or her work to a peer review group, the work is either accepted or rejected. If rejected, then the first scientist goes back to the drawing board. If accepted, then the work should generate more questions, leading to more scientific endeavors and predictions. An accepted hypothesis that generates falsifiable predictions has the potential to become a theory. If the predictions are made accurately, then the hypothesis rises as more data supports it. But one single piece of data can turn a hypothesis on its head. Regardless, any and all verifiably true facts that your hypothesis turns up must be retained, even if the hypothesis itself turns out to be false. A shift from one hypothesis to another must necessarily account for all previously recorded data or else the new hypothesis is just as flawed as the old one. But what happens if the hypothesis is confirmed by huge amounts of data and that hypothesis encompasses multiple hypotheses? Then, the hypothesis becomes a theory. Theories are very well-supported, well-substantiated, well-documented explanations for our observations, and different types of theories include atoms, cells, how germs cause diseases, gravity, heliocentrism, tectonic plates, evolution, general and special relativity, etc. Theories can contain a number of laws within them, but theories don't ever become laws themselves. The theory of evolution will never become a law of evolution, no matter how well substantiated it is. However, evolution contains a number of laws within it, such as the Hardy-Weinberg equation and Mendel's laws of genetics. So there you have it, the scientific method. Ask a question, generate a hypothesis, gather data, form a conclusion, have your work peer-reviewed, rinse, and repeat. A hypothesis that works will eventually become a theory, and theories don't become laws. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.